sharing experience is really important. Learning from each other, hearing from our expert speakers. I want everyone to really take control of their health because it's your body and your life and if you're not in control of it, no one else will be. It turns out that almost all pacemakers are completely fine to go through an MRI scan. Both capital ablation and surgical treatment show good results. HRT for many women is a real, is a lifesaver. However, and it was a real shock, they told me I did need a transplant. It's funny being a carer, you know, sometimes people don't take their medicines properly and you get cross at them. Why are you not taking your medicines I would say the next big stage in the development of this story was our understanding that this is many people a genetic condition. So it's an heritable and transmissible disease. So some of the pros of genetic testing are that we can find a positive gene change in some people. Actually, just to start, as I pass by this slide, these are my, my, I have to do this at all presentations now, the conflicts of interest. And what I always say now is that doesn't mean I have a Ferrari parked outside. <laughs> but I couldn't have done that 10 years ago. I couldn't have done this five years ago. Because suddenly, cardiomyopathy is cool. At least as far as the pharma industry is concerned. Did I hear an applaud then? Go on, applaud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I've been asked to give an impossible talk, which is state-of-the-art in cardiomyopathy in 10 minutes. So I'm not going to. I'm going to focus on one particular area. But what I will draw your attention to is this document, which is the first international guideline, comprehensive guideline for all cardiomyopathies, published by the European Society of Cardiology, uh, led by my colleague, Great Ormond Street, Juan Pablo Kaski. And this document covers the full breadth of issues which I th think and hope are relevant to people living with the condition. So I would advise you go and see it. It's technical in parts, but it's very comprehensive. Um, we haven't made a great deal of change within that document. A lot of it is just sort of corralling what we currently know. We did invent a new cardiomyopathy, which we're still trying to work our way through, non-dilated LV cardiomyopathy, which I suspect will come up in other meetings. And we've also tried to emphasize the comprehensive approach to diagnosis in that cardiomyopathy is not just simply a number on an echocardiogram. To make a proper diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, to understand the cause of someone's heart muscle disease requires an integrated and iterative process starting from the history all the way through to specialist testing, including genetics. But what I'm going to talk about is treatment. Because as I, as I implied, this is where there is so much activity and excitement now. Now look, it's not that we don't treat people at the moment. We have a lot of options for people with cardiomyopathy, depending on the type. And that's why we still use these descriptive terms, hypertrophic, dilated, ARVC, because these terms do have implications for how you manage people, whether it's with a defibrillator or sometimes with drugs, etc. And for some cardiomyopathies, our therapies are very effective. So if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, your prognosis has been transformed over the past 10 to 20 years through the use of evidence-based therapy, including all the drugs that many of you will be familiar with, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, etc., defibrillators, such that if you look at survival curves now for people with dilated cardiomyopathy, this is from Italy, you can see there is this progressive reduction in mortality which gives the lie to those of you who have dilated cardiomyopathy, probably 90% of you, when you were given that diagnosis, had your Google moment, which is that you're not going to survive for more than two years. Complete fallacy. Oh. Let's see this. I've got to show you a cartoon. I can't remember. Um, we've also got other stuff we can do. It's not just about the drugs. We can fix valves on the catheter. We can give an drugs to prevent stroke. I say there's a lot of things. So, so as cardiologists, we like to think of ourselves as being masters of the universe. So why do we need something new? Well, let me show you why in the case of dilated cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy, for cardiologists, very simply diagnosed as a big heart which doesn't contract very well. I'm showing you there's a lot of drugs we can give. We've got tons of trials showing that we can improve outcomes. But the problem is there are stories within the noise 
And one of those stories is if you take people with dilated cardiomyopathy and you say, do you have a gene which is causing your disease or not? If you carry a gene, your chance of having sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest is higher than if you don't have a gene. If you look at that in a more granular way, it's particular genes that increase that risk. But if you take the noise of heart failure, you don't see that signal. And this has opened up a whole new vista for gene-specific management of people with cardiomyopathy. Again, survival curves for people with another gene, which is maybe about 5% of dilated cardiomyopathy, called lamin. And here the prognosis can be extremely poor unless you get in early with a defibrillator. Here again, another one called filament C, less common, maybe 5, 2, 3%. But as soon as your ventricle becomes abnormal, you become prone to sudden cardiac death. Not all these genes are about sudden cardiac death. Some of them are about progressive heart failure. This is another one called BAG3. The names don't really matter. What I'm just trying to show to you is that actually understanding the genetic mutation has suddenly become critical to how you manage people. With regard to preventing sudden death, we've been, we've, the community of physicians have been developing tools which allow us to estimate risk. This is one for lamin. We've recently done one for desmond plakin. There's one coming out for vitamin C, blah, blah, blah. blah. There's, we're trying to, be a, trying to get to the point where we can put a number on the risk and then have an intelligent, informed discussion with the patient in front of us about has that crossed the threshold of putting in a defibrillator. And here it is in the guidelines. Yes, you look at the function of the heart, but there's a gene-specific risk assessment. Okay. So that's... Um, Sort of trying to prevent sudden death. And of course, everything we do is trying to improve people's prognosis in the, in the sense of how long you live. But something maybe which we've, maybe it sounds strange to say we've been less good at, is focusing on how, what it's like to live with a condition. So how good are we at that? Well, let me take this disease. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is an echocardiogram. This is a thick heart. And people with this disease, and indeed many of the other cardiomyopathies, complain of breathlessness, knackered all the time, chest pain, my heart keeps racing, I keep feeling dizzy, I've blacked out a few times. Familiar? In people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that's sometimes caused by this problem. This is a transesophageal echo. This is the atrium, the top chamber, the bottom chamber. That's the inlet valve, the mitral valve. And you look very carefully, it's sort of moving forwards each time the heart beats, and it actually causes obstruction to the outflow of the heart. And we have ways of dealing with that. Some of you may be receiving this therapy. So we get beta blockers, calcium antagonists, a drug called disapyramide. And if that doesn't work, we sometimes do an operation or inject alcohol into the muscle. Lots we can do, right? Yeah, but if you actually ask people who are being actively treated how they feel, they still feel breathless, they still get dizzy, they still get palpitations, they still get fatigued, they still get chest pain. Maybe we're not as good as we think we are. And that is the case, one of the cases for developing new drugs. And the, anybody on Mavacampton here? Okay, let's just start. <laughs> We've got two. So this is a, a first in class drug. Um, it's built around an understanding of the underlying genetics of the condition, which affects the proteins that cause the heart to contract. Do you want a, something a bit more graphic? This is what's happening millions of times in your cells, where these proteins bind to each other, slide across each other, and make the heart muscle contract. And in some people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this mechanism goes wrong, such that the proteins hang on for too long. And so it was argued that well, maybe if we give a drug which reduces that binding, we can maybe reduce hypertrophy and treat symptoms. And indeed, again, coming back to this obstruction problem, we now have randomized trials in people with obstruction giving Mavacampton, a drug which inhibits that contraction. And here we have a randomized trial. It still makes me a bit dizzy to say that in cardiomyopathy, a randomized clinical control trial in cardiomyopathy. I told you I've been coming here since 1993 never been able to say that before. But if you give this drug to people with obstruction, they feel better, they can do more. Markers in the blood which tell you that the heart is under strain 
improve. Put it another way, you know, there's always a placebo effect, but you are far more likely to improve than you were if you were taking placebo. This is now not the only drug. This is, this is what happens when you develop new therapies. It opens the floodgates. And of course, you know, there's a very powerful incentive, you know, ka -ching. <laughs> But it gives us an opportunity as a community to benefit from investment in new, in new drug development. So we now have a second drug, Afikampton, which pretty much does the same thing, improves symptoms, improves exercise tolerance, improves quality of life scores. Do we now have two drugs? So now within the guidelines, we've gone from this way, this is what we've been talking about since 1993 and beyond, to now having therapy where we can add in Mavicampton. Now that's about people with obstruction, but that's not where the story ends because these drugs do, what's that noise? <laughs> um, this drug also helps the heart to relax. That's a holy grail in cardiology, finding drugs which help the heart to relax. So this means that it may be effective in people with non-obstructive disease. And we have some evidence that it can improve markers in the blood, that it can improve exercise tolerance next year. We'll find out from one trial, the Odyssey trial, and the second one probably towards the end, the, uh, the Acacia trial, showing whether or not this is effective in non-obstructive disease. This is from one, one of the companies, Cytokinetics. Trials, trials, trials. This is the big news in, in cardiomyopathy land. Get even more radical. So I would argue that cardiomyopathies are out in the vanguard of how we think about treating cardiac disease more generally. Because most of what we do in cardiology is palliative. It's treating the symptom, it's treating the consequences of an illness rather than the underlying cause of that illness. Well, wouldn't it be a good idea to treat the cause? Thank you. I think the, the game changer here was this condition. Anybody in the room with cardiac amyloidosis? So this is a, a, a condition where you get abnormal proteins laid down inside the heart. It can be a, it's mostly a disease of aging. It can be inheritable. It can sometimes be associated with problems in your bone marrow. Um, the most common type, which is associated with aging, is caused by a protein which is produced by the liver. And that pro protein dissociates into bits, which then reaccumulate as almost like cement, if you like, within the heart muscle. And so it was argued that, well, maybe if we can stop that protein breaking up, we can stop this deposition and potentially treat the disease. And what do you know? Another randomized clinical control trial of a drug which does that to famidus. Now, this is an unusual heart failure trial because most, most heart failure trials are done in people in their sort of late 50s, early 60s. The average age in this trial was 75 because that's the demographic that this disease affects. And yet still, a 30% reduction in mortality, but more importantly, I would argue, is that it stops you declining in terms of your symptom class and how much you can walk. And you know, as you get older, as we all get older, that balance between how long you live and how well you live changes. So we can keep people healthier for longer um, and prevent them going into hospital. And again, once again, you get one drug and more drugs come along. Here's, the sec here's another one, second uh, class, if you will. Um, so there are lots happening in terms of drugs. Where this, this has been science fiction, so what do I mean by that? Well, I've been talking a lot about genetic disease, so can we correct the underlying genetic defect? And at least in theory, we can. We've got lots of ways of doing that. Details don't matter, but if you've got a gene that doesn't produce a protein, can you replace it within the cell? If you've got a gene which is misspelt, can you, my God, go in change the code in the gene to correct the underlying genetic, genetic defect. In theory, what we call gene editing is now possible. And in terms of gene replacement, so getting normal gene into the cell, this has now been done. It's been done in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of people, two people, um, using a, an inert virus to deliver the gene into the cell. And people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy next year first people with ARBC will be dosed in a trial. Will it work? I don't know. 
but it's an example of this incredible, almost a frenzy of activity in exploring ways to treat the underlying cause of disease. The gene editing thing has been done in amyloid. So actually going in and so resequencing the gene. My final point is again, where cardiomyopathy I think is driving change in the, which, in, in the way in which cardiologists think about trials. Most of our big trials have all been about improving prognosis. And what we do is we give a drug and we look at the average response. So we say, well, on average, people who received the drug lived for a bit longer than those who didn't receive the drug. Success. Um, but remember what I was saying earlier is that what about living with the disease? How good are these drugs at helping you live with the disease? And they're not as good as you might think. When we think about trials, there are a number of ways in which you can determine the efficacy of a drug or an intervention. This is what we normally do, so how many events happen. This, looking at symptoms or measurements of function, has always been regarded as being a second-class endpoint for a trial because it's very subjective, etc., etc. But this is where we now focus in cardiomyopathy trials because fortunately events are still relatively rare in people with HCM or DCM or ARVC. So doing event-driven trials is actually quite hard in cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately now, the, the organizations that license drugs, so FDA in the States, MHRA in this country, uh, European Medicines Agency, rest of Europe, are now talking about endpoints which, as they say, it's how patients feel and function. And if you can show that people feel and function better, that is reason enough to license a, dr a drug or an intervention. So now what we're doing is we're trying to find out robust ways of assessing how people live with their disease. And this can be done through quality of uh, life scores. It can be done through functional tests like exercise testing. But this is now becoming the norm in trials. And the final thing which I think cardiomyopathy is driving change in is I, I said, when we do trials, we look at the average response. Well, that's great, but it may be that we're missing potential benefit. We're all different, some more different than others. But when we give a drug or an intervention, some people will respond, some people may not respond, some people may get worse. And if you just look at the average response, you may be misled as to the benefits or otherwise of an intervention. So now we're starting to look at individual responses. So if we can understand what it is that makes some people respond and others actually get worse with an intervention, maybe we can do better with those who get worse. And this is now a very common paradigm in cancer therapy. What we want to do is to bring that into cardiac therapy. So um, what does that gobbledy mean? Gobbledygook means what well, it means that as well as just looking at the function and the size of your heart and all the rest of it, therapy, this new era in therapeutics and cardiomyopathy is fundamentally determined by its cause, what we call etiology. And I wouldn't have imagined that back in 1993. Thank you very much.